this may seem like a weird question, but given that uh, Utah hasn't elected a Democrat to the U.S. Senate for decades, um, are there benefits to running, knowing that if if passed his prologue, you're likely to lose? Are there benefits of running even if, if you know you are likely to lose? Yeah, so the personal calculation for me was... Uh, first and foremost, is this doable with my family? And it is right now. My kids are in our sweet spot. And I, I'm happy that we're a year in. And I actually said to my husband maybe three or four months ago, on a scale of one to ten, how much has this impacted our family one way or the other? And it was a two. Well, it's probably a five now because um, it's summer. My kids are out of school. I'm working. And, you know, my friends are stepping in and taking them to the camps and, so I, I am home a little less this summer, but my kids join me. We're getting ready for parade season, so they're going to be out with me more. They've traveled the state with me. So we're going to be, as a family, doing this a little bit more now that they're out of school. So I was able to do it. Um, th there wasn't going to be too much of a personal cost. Um, you know, I am, a, as I mentioned, my husband works. I... He supports my political life. I have a council job, so I remain involved in my council duties, and we've been quite busy lately. Uh, but I'm able to dedicate the time. So so that was important that it worked for my family, and, and it is. And I think being a senator will work for my family, given we run every six years. I chose not to run for the House of Representatives. Um, there might have been a better opportunity to win from that. But I, I basically was joking around saying, like, I don't want to buy – uh, you know, a ticket to a lottery that I don't want to win. Like, I, I don't think I, I don't want to be in the House of Representatives because I still have a young family and it's every two years and you don't stop campaigning. I think and I, I can have more influence in the Senate for the state of Utah as a Democrat. And so it was worth the risk and the time. And again, I felt like we needed a strong voice to build for the future, to have me step up and do this. Um, but I think that it certainly gives me more exposure. Uh, I hope it's positive exposure. I have a forum. Um, you're talking to me for a couple of hours. So people, you know, what does Jenny think? And I have an opportunity to share my values, share what I believe needs to happen in this state. And I know how to take advantage of that. So I think there are benefits back. Um, if I return to the Salt Lake County Council, I've expanded my it's almost like an apprenticeship on what's going on throughout the state because I've been Salt Lake County focused for, uh, you know, when, when Orton was in office, I traveled the state representing him. I traveled with my father in the 80s. Um, I recreate in the state. But to go in and actually talk to somebody in Delta, Utah, about how they feel about the power plant potentially closing or shifting over um, to natural gas. I mean, there, that's a real concern in that community. That's good for me to know in my public life. And come November 7th, I'm still an elected official serving this community. I still have a bully pulpit. I still have a voice in the process. You don't have to resign. No. Okay. So. Um, how long has it been? This is a trick question. How long has it been since a, 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 a woman senator was elected from Utah? <laughs> I would be the first. So Utah's never elected. We've never elected a woman to the U.S. Senate. Yeah. In fact, we've it, only elected one woman statewide, and that's Jan Graham. She was a Democrat attorney general in the 90s. Olene Walker was appointed governor. Um, she was the lieutenant governor when Levitt took the health and human services position. Um, so he vacated the seat, she moved up, she became governor, but she then turned around to run for governor and the Republican Party chose someone else, even though she was a sitting governor, which is unheard of. I mean, I look back to that now as a statewide female elected and I'm like, wow, that's, you know, I, I have some empathy for Aline um, in that position, the position she was in back then. So Utah's never elected a woman to be governor or Only one or to US statewide or to or be the US, US, Senate. US Senate. We have had Congress women. Yeah, we've had Congress women, okay. including Mia Lepp, who's there now. Right. Yeah. And Enid Green. Enid. If, if my yeah. memory and is And Enid was there when I was serving for Bill Orton. I was gonna say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We had some drama during that era. <laughs> okay. So um yeah, and is there this is gonna be probably the weirdest question of all. Is there can you imagine a scenario where Utah would elect a Democrat to the U.S. Senate in 
in 2018? So there was a poll done, me versus um, Hatch, and I had an 11-point lead, which proves to me that Utah's willing to support a Democrat. And Is that I, why one of the reasons why Hatch didn't run? I, I've got to think he had his own internal polling and people around him saying, you've had many years of service. Um, I'm sort of disappointed and sort of sad about Orrin Hatch. I, I mean, he was always too conservative for me, frankly. But I, um, he, he has been very kind to me personally, kind to my father who he defeated, um, really always asks about how they're doing when I um, had seen him as an elected at various events or what have you. But I think he really um, took a very strange turn the last year and a half or two under the Trump presidency. And I think that the public was rejecting his candidacy. So I don't think it was that I was there necessarily, but I'm sure they looked at my background and where I was polling and said, whoa, we need to, I mean, what I brought to the table was a viable candidate. I get that it's Utah. I get that I'm not a Republican. I understand polling. I'm not naive. But on the other hand, I am taking this seriously. I'm seeking media opportunities. I'm raising money. Uh, we have, I've far outraised any other candidate running for this office. Other than maybe my dad, when he was taking on Hatch back in that era, I, I think my dad raised a million some odd. And, you know, I'm approaching 700,000. So, I think in today's dollar, my dad probably outraised me, but um, I there hasn't been a strong funded or, or somebody's raised a fair amount of money since that time. So, uh, I, you know, I'm not taking this lightly. Yeah. And man, Utah, elect a freaking female governor and female senator. What are you doing, Utah? <laughs> we need well, more women. It's and what I say is. Democrats aren't going to take over if you send Jenny Wilson to the U.S. Senate. But what you're going to get is somebody talking to the other side of the aisle. Um, I have worked with Ron Wyden in the past when I worked for Lessa Coyne in Oregon. He's been the one fighting for payment in lieu of taxes, which is what our counties need to compensate for the federal land that's all held and they can't expand their tax base. So let's pay a fair share. It's, it's Democratic Senator Ron Wyden who's got the backs of rural Utah let me help him and get that done. Um, he actually took the lead in putting those funds back in the budget after Trump's budget had zeroed them out. Uh, where was Orrin Hatch? Uh, there are many issues that Democrats have stood for Utah um, and really are representing us on that side of the aisle. So wouldn't it be great to have a voice from Utah to the other side of the aisle? Um, I'm... You know, I, I'm nothing if I'm not direct. I'll answer any question, and I don't flip-flop. So you can know that I will be there advocating for Utah, putting it first, and will be willing to stand up to Chuck Schumer or anybody else, And even if it means I'm a one-term senator. So I think, you know, if you're going to have Mitt Romney one-term or a Jenny Wills, I, think, I actually think I'm the better choice of those two options because um, there's more of the same on that side. And we already have Mike Lee and, you know, four... Uh, House members right. who align with the Republican Party. It might right. be good to shake it up a little bit. All right. So just to close this segment, a couple comments from listeners. Glenn writes, this lady is the change Utah needs. Stephanie uh, Sorensen Larson of Encircle House says, love you, Jenny Wilson. Do you know Stephanie? I do know Stephanie. Yeah. She worked for Bill. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe she should like confirm that that's the one. But yeah, she's, she's... an attorney. Went to BYU. Yes, yes, yes. Her yes. husband Mitch is an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, awesome! See, she's, she's two a... connections from the past already. Victoria writes, "Jenny is an empowered woman. I love it." Um, and uh, you just say like all those negative Shandy. ones. You're not reading, right? No, I my, my <laughs> no. This is just I'm reading what's here. And then Shandy, hi Shandy. She writes, "Go Jenny, go." So a lot of love so far from our listeners. So um, this wraps up part one of our interview with uh, Jenny Wilson. We're not ending. I'm just sort of like, we'll break this up and, and start the next section for the, for the stuff we release. But thank you for joining us, Jenny. This has been a great first hour and 20 minutes. We've gone a little bit over. But we're going to turn right back around and start again. 
And we're going to talk issues. Is that all right? Awesome. Sure. So listeners, thank you. And viewers, thank you. Uh, everyone joining us live on Facebook, thank you for uh, joining us for this first part of an interview with uh, Jenny Wilson, a Democratic uh, nominee for the U.S. Senate, uh, likely to run against uh, Mitt Romney uh, this fall 2018. So uh, join us immediately for part two, where we're going to talk issues with Jenny. Thanks, everybody. Oops. Thanks, everybody. Uh, See you in a second. All right, we're back. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome back to part two of my interview with Jenny Wilson. This is Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is June 22nd, 2018. We just spent a good hour and 20 minutes talking to Jenny Wilson about um, her growing up in Utah, uh, her dad, who was the mayor of Salt Lake City for many years, who ran for governor. Uh, and her own career uh, as a as a um, you know working for uh, politicians in in uh, Washington D.C. and uh, other sorts of pursuits, including uh, you know being elected for two terms, working for the Salt, Salt Lake City County. What is the Salt term? Lake County Council? Council, yes. yeah. So um, we've talked about. Uh, running as a Democrat in Utah and whether or not that's a fool's errand. We've decided that it's not a fool's errand. Um, and we've talked a bit about why Jenny wants to run. Um, now we're going to just dive into issues. Great. Is that all right? Sure. Um, okay. At the very highest level, you touched on this a tiny bit. Um, what, can you explain how Trump got elected and what not in a way that's negative, just right. like, what yeah, does that say absolutely. about our country Yeah, and, and what our needs are? Yeah. So I think I, I felt in the 90s that Congress was pretty broken when I worked back there. And it was interesting because... That was like Newt Gingrich. Yeah, the new, right? I was there for the Newt Gingrich takeover on the Democratic side. Now, Bill Orton was relatively junior in Congress. He'd been only there a year, I guess two terms. Um, that happened in 94, 92, 94. So in any event, it was 94. So Bill had been there two terms. And um, so pretty radical change. And I think the Democrats were shocked that it actually really happened and the House was lost. And so I look at that era and how divided things were. And, you know, I'd been raised the daughter of the mayor who worked across party lines, who worked with Republicans, more balanced time, as we talked about earlier, in terms of party affiliation and leadership in the state. But um, I was sort of struck that, like, the parties I would go to and the friends I hung out to were divided by party. And that seemed strange to me. And um, so I felt that Congress was fairly dysfunctional back then, but um, it's even more so now. I mean, the divisions are further. Uh, I think one thing that was raised about the Senate that made me think, I was watching Meet the Press several months ago, and I cannot recall who the Republican senator uh, who was being interviewed, but I do remember what he said. He said one of the reasons that the Senate isn't as collegial as it used to be across party lines is that we now have um, Fridays off, so people are flying home typically on Thursday nights, and they're not staying together over the weekend where they're getting together socially and having offline conversations one-to-one. -one. And I do that as a council member. Like, we have quorum requirements, and we, we can't, uh, none of us can get together, no, no more than four of us can get together to discuss policy, and we don't do that very often. But we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations about how we're thinking about things that help us evolve policy initiatives, and then we bring them for discussion be for the full council. And I think that's been lost. So what I really believe is that the federal government, not just because Congress is less collegial, but the federal government has become more and more bureaucratic. And then when you have budget meltdown and you fund by continuing resolution, not by new budgeting, nothing changes. And that leads to more, um, you know, arm's length between the federal government and our needs locally. So I think that needs to change. Now, I don't, I'm not naive enough to think that I would go Jenny Wilson and wave a magic wand 
and change it immediately, but we need to elect a new generation of leaders who get that and who will stand up and make that change and who will push aside the party infrastructure and networks. And I'm pretty closely affiliate, affiliated with the Democratic Party. I'm not going to be dishonest in this conversation and not say that I am. I ran for a national committee position from my state because I wanted to have an influence within the DNC. And I was put on the Rural Advisory Committee to represent our Democrats and how we can reach out to rural America. And I've worked on those tax forces. So it's not that I'm not aligned with my party. I am. But I'm also willing to be a change maker within the party and stand up to it. So in any event, I think that what happened was this lack of attention to people by the federal government. And and I think people are tired of a political script, which is why they, Donald Trump was resonating with them. I actually think Donald Trump became famous by a TV show, his own TV show, which he managed. So what people were seeing from Trump may not be the Trump that they got, but they were used to him and they liked the brashness and the no BS nature of Donald Trump. And I think to this day, um, I was at a lunch before I came here and just engaged with these two, um, their drug um, agent officer investigators. Um, at the event I was honored at, I sat and had lunch with them. And I didn't know them, a little bit older, but still Trump, diehard Trump supporters. And they like that, that, the tweets don't alarm them as they do me because they like that he's saying what, he thinks. And I think what we saw from Hillary, Hillary Clinton was way too much script. Where was her authentic self, which led to a question of trust. And I think um, one of the reasons that Bernie Sanders was so popular was that exact reason. He didn't fall into the Democratic mold. He said what he thought. Um, he wants to bring about reform and change. And I had worked with Bernie Sanders when I worked uh, for the House when he was in the House and knew him. And I didn't really see, I, I didn't really think he was the right messenger to bring about the unity I want to see, which is why I really didn't fall into the Bernie Sanders camp. But I think um, affordable college, transformation of government, all, many, many principles that he stood for, I identify with. And, and, and this idea that we don't need to be so scripted, I think is very much what people were identifying with. And then you look at the fact that Democrats forgot how to message to our base. And that's a reminder to me. And I think I'm genuinely interested in um, a fair social platform and economic platform for people. So I tend to identify, I think, very much with workers um, in the state of Utah and their needs and our the fact that we the rich are getting richer and that we have wage um, wages not keeping up with our economic prosperity in the state. So I think there was that, that Trump got that and Hillary Clinton didn't. So that's generally what I think happened. And there are others who have evaluated it more in depth who could give you a better answer sure. than me, but that's my perspective. April writes, absolutely candor, honesty, whether it is pretty or not. So April's reflecting this idea that we're just looking for authentic politicians. Yeah. And you and I, I, I don't know that there'll be a candidate that says I'm inauthentic. Yeah. Having said that, you feel like that's part of your what you have to offer. It's just. Yeah. Candor and it's I'll be honest. It's one of my concerns about Romney. We've seen such change in his positions. It's OK to evolve. But on major issues, he's had two positions. One is governor of Massachusetts. A different one is candidate um, for for U.S. president to get the Republican nomination. And then I don't know what we're going to get now. So so, so that's, I was going to go to that next. So I, I actually worked at Bain and was a Romney fan in principle because of his reputation at Bain and Company. And then he was like the governor of a, of a largely Democratic state. So, and he had the business background. And so back then I was like, oh, wow, he can work with Democrats. He works across the aisle. And then he got the sense that he was for, uh, you know, pro-choice. He was, he seemed to be kind of pro-LGBT. Like, there was a lot to like yeah. for me back then, right. right? Right. So, but yeah, when he tried to run for president twice, right, he was, people never really felt like he was authentic and genuine. Yeah. I think the criticisms were, number one, he's 
done 180s on several issues. And I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying this is the perception that I've been privy to, that he changed a lot on issues and that he was a bit robotic or mechanical, right? Right. Uh, well, Who is he? Who is Mitt Romney? And I don't know. What are his principles, I, don't, I just right? don't know. So talk about that. So talk about, um, you, you were, I was actually quite impressed, and this speaks to this issue of candor, we talked about Mitt Romney in the last episode and you talked about working for him when he was running the Olympics in Salt Lake and you were very, you spoke very favorably of yeah. him when you could yeah. have, I'm sure you could dig up dirt or come up with things to say bad about him, but you didn't. You gave an honest assessment, which was favorable, which you, some would think you wouldn't be incentivized to do. So now that we've, now that you've said nice things about Romney for this episode, what are your criticisms or concerns about him as a candidate? So my issue is it's 2018. One of us will be sworn in in 2019. Is this the best role for Mitt Romney? And I don't think it is. I think, and, and there was a, it's worth Googling um, the New York Times piece on him from two weeks ago where they talk about his motivations. And there's not much in there that says, I want to serve the people of Utah. The article reflects someone who has served the nation um, as a candidate, who served a state, not Utah, and someone who now, uh, as Ann says, wants to go into the burning building. Well, we need as a nation to collectively, all senators and congresspeople care about our nation, but I will be going to the U.S. Senate to serve this state. And that's a true heartfelt motivation of someone who lives here is raising their family here, who loves the state. So I don't question, um, like, I, I like Mitt and Ann Romney, and I'd love to go to dinner with them and hang out, but I and have a tour of one of their beautiful homes. But I don't think this is the best role for him in 2019 as our senator. He's, um, you know, we talk so much about seniority. That's all we heard from Orrin Hatch for the past two or three, you know, cycles when he was reelected. I'm bringing home the goods for the state of Utah. It's because of my seniority. Well, Mitt's at the point in his career that he, he can't do multiple, multiple terms. Uh, I'm not saying I would, but I think at my age, understanding that a term or two will need to be um, expended by any new person in the process. So we're going to see a turnaround with the seat either way. Romney won't seek re-election, I wouldn't think, or if he doesn't, maybe for one more term. So there's that. And I also think that this idea of um, service to a state, uh, on the campaign trail against Kennedy a couple of times, he said, well, this is the way we did it in Massachusetts. Well, it's Utah, and we do things differently here for good reason. And we have unique needs in this state. And so I really just don't believe that uh, a continuation of the Republican policies uh, are are going to are going to benefit us. And we have Mike Lee, a constitutionalist. That's where he, that's his comfort zone. A, a senior staff member even said that to me the other day that that is his comfort zone. That's where he falls. I think knowing like having somebody serve who's worked on the opioid crisis, who's balanced a budget as a local elected, who works across party lines, who thrives on policy. That's what I do best. That's what we need in the U.S. Senate. And that's where I just think it's a, you have a choice. And I'm not, if Mitt Romney succeeds in November, um, you know, my life goes on, his does as well. I just think we're missing an opportunity. Some people, this is just a comment I've heard several people say, it's, I really didn't like Mitt Romney, but Trump is so much more awful, according to these people. Man, Romney would have been much better. Let's go with Romney. Have you heard that kind yeah, of logic? Yeah, that's we don't have that choice. We're not going to rewind time. We're electing a U.S. senator from the state of Utah. And I, I actually think what I've heard of from the, the comments Mitt has made or others have said that, you know, sort of relating to his motivations – um, early it was to hold Trump accountable. Like the Utahns were saying, well, I want Romney in there because he's going to tell Trump. Because he's a high profile national, yeah, no yes. name with power, right. you know. Right. So this idea that he's going to hold Trump accountable, well, this is yet another deal where he's kind of pulled back on that more anti-Trump. You know, the, the most um, scathing speech that was given 
in advance of Trump's nomination came from Mitt Romney. And now we're saying, we're hearing, oh, thank you, Mr. President, for your endorsement of me. And he said the other day that he agrees with Trump's policies. So, you know, it, to me, it's a matter of which Romney. I mean, I, again, is what's the, who is the authentic Romney? If, you know, just a year and a half ago, he was repulsed by Trump. And now that Trump has power, he's behind him. So I, I'm just confused still. And I think that confusion I'm hearing as I talk to people throughout the state is like, you know, I don't, that very point that you bring up is one that citizens raise as well. Uh, we, we talked about this a bit, but I'm just gonna ask this really directly. Why does America need more women in the U.S. Senate? How, how would we benefit as a nation by having more women? And well, Utah specifically, yeah. how could yeah. Utah benefit from having its first female U.S. senator? So in government, I've never approached any decision that I make um, as a, oh, I'm a woman, what is the feminist point of view, or what's the women's point of view, or what's the mother, mother's point of view? But I've had those experiences as a woman. I know for a fact, as a woman in the workforce, um, and I've had these conversations with men who had the same college degree as mine, who entered the workforce. I, think, I actually think it's tougher for a woman to make it in the work world. Um, I've seen that enough. I've had enough anecdotal conversations with friends about our challenges, rising above, getting to senior management. We know that the journey is harder. So I bring a certain scrappiness to the table as a multitasking mother who's solving problems. Um, I don't know that sensitivity is a women's attribute only. I've seen sensitive men, but I get teased for, you know, being, you know, the sensitive woman. I actually burst into tears the other day talking about the border in my speech on Tuesday at my county council meeting and, and, and got very emotional over it. And it was my, um, and I, and I know that a father could and has done the same thing, but it was my maternal sense in that moment of what's happening on the border that just drove me to, to want to impact that horrible situation. And I, so I guess I bring that to a table and women bring that to the table as, as we, but, but fundamentally we have more than 50% of women in the workforce and, or I'm stating that wrong. Um, the, the vast majority of women that are of working age in the state of Utah work. So with that, why don't we have more of them in our House of Representatives, in our state Senate, running for these offices? Why aren't there more Mia Loves and Jenny Wilsons? I think it's a really important point. So somehow in this process, we've sent the signal to women that they're either not qualified or that this isn't a career that they would aspire to serve in. So I just think that we should be conscious of that and finding ways to promote women and women's involvement in government. So I take that seriously when I'm out speaking or when I have the opportunity. I always share how rewarding it is not to be a woman in government, but to be in government. So I do think there's some barriers to entry that we need to overcome to get more women in politics. And I do think a women's voice, um, and it's not, it, again, I don't want to, f to stereotype to the point that men can't carry some of the, the, the interests that I've carried as an elected, because I think it's person to person unique. But I, I was the one that wanted to serve on human services committees and, uh, in, in my council. I've worked on the opioid crisis and worked very hard at some issues that I think tend to be human impact kind of issues, healthcare, um, the opioid crisis, mental health, substance abuse. These are all areas that are very much a part of my policy arena, and I, I want to work to, to solve problems in those arenas. Excellent. Shifting gears a bit, let's talk about the church, uh, the LDS church specifically. Um, probably the number one question I received from our listenership is to what extent will the LDS church influence your decisions as a U.S. Senator? That's a uh, complex well, question. it's a good question. So I think that there's no way I would enter as a U.S. Senator and not understand the influence of the LDS church on our citizenry. But there's also a vast 
I mean, number of people that are not affiliated with the LDS church, either they're not active LDS or they're just another religion or they're agnostic or what have you. So I think understanding that the LDS church does have influence is important and that um, the LDS church does a lot of good with its social services networks. And I think going, I, I, the way I think it would play out is first of all, if I if I win this race, I'm going to have a line of people wanting to talk to me that may not have been knocking on my door. Um, and I actually would imagine that government relations for the LDS Church will be among them. So at that point, it's like, how can I um, be of service to the LDS Church in the U.S. Senate in the sense of um, we know that the LDS Church influences people in the state and that it's a major employer and that in uh, the heart of our capital city, it has invested. And I think that's real. So I wouldn't dismiss that. But um, there are not, there would be no policy influence per se, other than my own, um, I hope, balanced sense of who I am as an elected now and who I would be as a senator related to my own upbringing and the, the things that I have already mentioned that I was taught uh, by the LDS Church that have influenced my life and my choices. But I, I don't want the LDS Church knocking at my door and telling me how to vote because just like Chuck Schumer trying that approach, it probably wouldn't go over that well. Now, I would say, let me hear what you have to say, but um, I have operated independently. I think I'm a strong independent thinker, and ultimately what I like to do in making any decision now or in the future is get all of the information and land on a position. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the concerns come out of the perception that the church tells, and I know this is at the at the state level, but yeah. it's like, here's how you vote on the liquor laws. Here's yeah. how you vote on marijuana. Here's how you vote on same-sex marriage or LGBTQ rights. Yeah, And it's just sort of like a yeah. theocracy in a sense. And the truth, the truth is, I really don't know. I have heard that there are signals or whatever that goes to leadership within the church um, in, in our leadership within the House of Representatives or the Senate, I really don't know because I haven't had that happen to me as a county elected. There's, so this, I there's think, this video that came out with Mormon leaks of like a Oregon senator meeting in front of like the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve and basically saying, oh, I, yeah. hey, I voted for the Iraq war because I think it'll break open the country and then Mormon missionaries will be able yeah. to come in and spread the gospel in a new you know, territory. Right. So, so right. deciding whether or not to go to war on how it might affect the church. You know what right. I mean? Right. Yeah. I, and it's I, missionary efforts. I think they might find other avenues than me for those <laughs> discussions, is my guess. Okay. Um, so, do you, w would you even have a way to estimate whether the church, the Mormon church, has too much influence in both state and federal politics? I think they have too much influence, but I think that. Well, I, the overt, th the one you refer to, I, I saw a clip of that, and that is wrong to me. Um, because I think we do have to have a separation of church and state. That's part of our fundamental, I mean, that's part of our constitutional principles, is separation of church and state. So I think that um, that we should be concerned of that very direct influence. Um, on the other hand, I think that the citizenry and the objectives um, you know, I think there's been this perception that Democrats don't reflect LDS principles, and I just think that's not true, especially back to my earlier points about the vision of Jesus Christ and the efforts made, um, you know, the, the efforts by many elected officials to serve those principles, whether they be Christian principles or Christian aligned or Muslim or any other, you know, do unto other principles. So I, I just think that um, we are better to keep um, the a clear separation of church and state, and that's really the principle that I would bring to governance. Um, another very prominent question I had, and this may seem out of place a little bit, there's been this recent discussion about uh, church leaders uh, interviewing children and, and adolescents behind closed doors, talking about explicit sexual sort of behaviors and, and practices, masturbation, that sort of thing. Um, and it's weird to ask you about this as you're running for a, a federal Senate office, but you have mentioned Me Too, yeah. you know, 
and, and women's rights and, and children's rights. So I, I sense this is an issue you might care deeply about, right. even if it's not a, pl a plank in your platform. <laughs> well, I, I'm certain that the LDS Church um, has the best intentions in terms of clergy and bishops and what have you. I just think that any decentralized system, you're going to have some challenges. And I can tell you, having traveled um, through rural Utah and areas, I do think when you have um, isolation, you're isolated from areas, in this case, out in areas throughout the world, rural Utah, what have you, maybe that lack of direct connection, you're going to have the ability to have more abuse. And that's of concern to me. So I think that um, for, and this isn't true, I don't, my concerns don't just fall into the LDS church camp as I look at, um, you know, you look at the priests and what's happened in the Catholic church and how horrific, and a black guy on that church. And I, I just feel that it's incumbent upon any religion and the LDS church to educate and do everything to um, when the, when those violations are revealed to take the right steps. And these are, I mean, in many cases, some actions could um, enter into the realm of criminal. And if and when those do happen, any institution, including the LDS Church, needs to step up and do the right thing. And we need to have, make sure that law enforcement and our mechanisms and systems in, in these more remote areas especially. I, I think, um, unfortunately, life's not simple. And we, we I mentioned rural Utah, but we have very difficult challenges in an urban setting like this one. I've been very involved in domestic violence um, and efforts to eradicate um, those challenges in our county. And we know that economic decline affects it. We know that alcoholism and drug abuse affects those challenges. We know that stress on a family, um, it, all of these things contribute to things that just make, that, 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 let, that end up being horrific practices. And I think where we, so I think about these things in terms of where I could impact policy. That's my lens, and I don't want to pass judgment on that in terms of very specific incidents. Um, I've already mentioned I'm not a weekly church-going member. Um, technically, I'm still a church member because I have not removed my name from the rolls, but I don't, like, I, it's not up to me to question practices except to say we know the difference between right and wrong, and when anyone, no matter their level within the Mormon church, uh, observes that or sees that, reporting it up, giving women um, a safety net and support is so critical. Giving families and children support is so critical. So I don't care if you're the Relief Society president or the bishop or a neighbor. Um, it's incumbent upon you as a human to to share and and do that well. And I and I hope that the people I know and love that are LDS are embracing that and doing that and supporting that. If that makes sense. What about just the practice of a of a 50 year old man being alone with a 12 year old girl? behind closed doors yeah, I, talking about sexual stuff. I don't think that's right. Okay. So that for you, that's pretty clear. That's cut. pretty clear cut. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, is it true that Utah has disproportionately high levels of sexual abuse in the state relative to other states? Are you aware of that? Because I've heard we have very high I can't rates of quote, sexual abuse. I can't, I, okay. I can't quote a statistic okay. on that. Um, you know, I, again, I just think that where being one of the things I feel is important as a community member, not necessarily elected official, is that we have channels um, of we have support networks, and they come in a lot of ways. And hopefully religion is one of them, and not the reverse of that. And that our community-based organizations are accessible, and they're well-funded, and people who are isolated in any way have a channel to get help. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is incredibly important um, within the state of Utah is that we accept that we're not perfect, that we are all on a journey, that um, we are all... I mean, I, I think that 
my community life, which tends to be aligned with people who are Democrats, not always. Um, I come from, as I mentioned, a family with active LDS um, uh, brothers and sisters. And I, but I, I really believe being open to expanding these networks where people who are suffering have an avenue out are really cute, critical in any community. And it's not just religion, it's not just government, it's all of us in it together. And where we can collectively foster those networks is so critical. And I, I'm i proud that I've worked on those issues. Um, I worked on expanding LGBT um, employee benefits, health benefits, back when it was a big deal. You know, I remember my first at policy initiative to expand health care benefits for county workers, four TV cameras showed up. And I looked around, and I'm like, why are they here? I had no idea. It was for my initiative, because I thought it just made sense. And it ended up being rather groundbreaking when I finally was able to pass that. And we were able, uh, from the local government level, to create more benefits. Uh, Salt Lake City stepped up, other communities stepped up. We now have non-discrimination ordinances throughout the state. The state has passed one. Um, that was groundbreaking. The Elders Church was involved in that too because they were there to stand for um, religious against religious discrimination and then LGBT discrimination. So we're coming. It's a long way, but you got to do it one step at a time. And each of us has to find our own avenue to advocate, step up, and support people. Speaking about that. Uh, with uh, Dan Reynolds' uh, new documentary coming out uh, through HBO June 25th, watch it, share it, about the LGBTQ plus suicide yeah. crisis, as some would describe it. Have in you Utah. seen it, by the way? I'm in it. Oh, you're in it. Yeah. Did you get a preview then too? Have I you yeah, seen it? I've seen it like twelve times. Oh, you have. Yeah, okay. it was a Sundance. So, and, oh, it's been a, okay. Oh, yeah. what was it Sundance? Yeah, it's super. So, so su- I, w- I was actually in New York just three days ago at the premiere. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So as a former Sundance employee, I didn't do yeah, no, Sundance yeah, this year because sure. I was campaigning. But I did, you're right. Okay, I can't wait to see it. It's super, it's super, it's this Monday. It's um, it's super cool. But okay. he's Good. he's been on Ellen. He's been on the Today Show. He's been on the, the Daily Show. Like, and all he's just saying, yeah. Utah's got an LGBTQ plus suicide crisis. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? Is it, from your perspective, is there a problem? Well, we look at our numbers and you've got a figure, right? You look at where we're seeing the suicides. And when I just mentioned community channels, wherever they may be, um, you know, and I think if, 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 if a given ward isn't progressive enough, hopefully there's a community organization that can help a young person. If the parents and the family don't know how to deal with that, hopefully there's another channel elsewhere, a friend, a school, another network. That's what's most important. And I, I think part of my um, advocacy right now as a Senate candidate and as an, an elected official currently in Salt Lake County, I really want people to understand like this idea of perfection, this idea that life's a breeze, it's not. We all suffer. Um, you look at Anthony Bourdain, who was one of, I just found his show so fascinating when I had time to watch it. Um, I didn't even know that he was such an accomplished celebrity chef because I knew him from you know his program where he would go into a community and dispel myths and eat with people and listen to them and engage with them and but there I mean if you've ever had a success story right a guy from New York who um, became a celebrity chef who had a tv show who traveled the world who had wealth and he ended up you know suicide you take Kate Spade famous designer she had anxiety whatever happened with their networks those were broken down and those are people with success money fame um, take a child in a family who's struggling and every ounce of or every influence around that child is everything that he or she is not. And um, adolescence is tough enough. So I just want um, to empower people with my voice in some way to pick up the phone, call a suicide hotline, find a friend, talk to somebody. If, if you know what, if you need to, if you're feeling down and you need to just go watch, go binge on your favorite TV show or 
go do what you if you find if you need some sort of safe escape aside from suicide find it but that's where I really think um, government can be a catalyst for action government can't solve those problems but funding programs I've worked very hard at um, finding avenues to increase funding for drug abuse substance abuse the opioid crisis the avenues for people suffering um, shelters for women who are uh, facing domestic violence. Those are all really um, key things that we have to find a way to fund in government and do that well, do it efficiently, and provide a safety net for somebody who's you know facing despair. And that includes youth and suicide. When you see very high rates um, of, let's just say, suicide and you know depression amongst LGBT youth, and you hear these stories and you're not actively LDS and you know the LDS church's historical opposition to things like same-sex marriage and, and same-sex love. And it, it would be easy to just say the problem is the church and to kind of wage jihad or war against the church and, yeah. just, and just kind of turn your guns right at the church and start firing. Do you have, do you ever... Can you understand that impulse and how do you... I understand it. I mean, I have two very close friends who... Um, one one actually works for me. One is a elected official colleague, um, both raised in LDS families, both openly gay. One's uh, married now with two wonderful children. One has a long-term partner. And they feel that... Um, tension very much and I identify with that having heard their stories and they um, are still they're in relatively strong they have relatively strong family relationships now and with their active LDS family but I, I do think that they look at the they look back at the despair of their youth and feel some hosti- hostility so I do get that um, but my objective, again, I, I'm not an analyst of the LDS Church. I'm not um, working to reform it. Uh, the, that's left over to my family members who are LDS or people in the church. And I, I do want those change agents out there because I think it's important. And it's important that we all accept that it's 2018 and life is different than the 1950s. And sometimes I think the LDS Church doesn't get that. But in any event, I um, want the change agents there. But that's not my role. My role is to figure out how in Salt Lake County right now I can help those networks and expand those networks and provide funding for drug treatment and do whatever's necessary to make sure our call lines are fel- are well funded and do those types of things and that goes with the US Senate candidacy as well so I'm a piece I think of working towards solutions um but you know I I think I've got enough on my plate to take on when and not be but I do get it, and I've, I've heard the stories. So if someone were to say, well, I'll vote for Jenny if she can help reduce LGBTQ plus suicides in Utah, would they have reason to choose you for that reason alone? Or are you yeah, saying I mean, that's I think, not something a U.S. senator can influence in a state? Oh, I think it can. I, th- I was responding more to your question about the LDS Church's role in that. Um, no, I do think— Many people yeah. say that we lead the nation because of the church. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, where the where the federal government can absolutely help help is through health and human services. That's a budget funded by Congress. And it is what trickles down to our communities in terms of funding um, that creates the 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 revenue that grants the opportunities for call lines and help centers and resources in the community. And, you know, we're a government we're we're not a France that everything's centralized with one national government. We have a diffused government with a federal system, a state system, a local system on down. And every government has its own role in that continuum. Um, I've, I'm proud of the work that I've done at Salt Lake County uh, to support social services and mental health services and provide a safety net in that arena to the best of my abilities. And I do think there's a federal role. So absolutely. And I think it starts with um, 
And whether it's a woman thing or it's a Democrat thing or it's just a Jenny thing, these are the issues I want to work on. And I want Congress to change and I want government to change. And I'm willing to invest, you know, years of my life in, 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 in trying to get Congress and the federal government to wake up, you know, and to, to be willing to do it differently and to align with the people who believe, as I do, that we can do things differently. One, uh, as I understand it, uh, nonprofits traditionally uh, file their financial reports at the end of each year, and then those financial reports, at least a part of them, become public information. So there's financial transparency with nonprofits. Mm. One of our listeners wanted to know, uh, but, but religions seem to have an exemption where mm. their financial filings aren't public information. So there's not financial transparency with religious nonprofits. Do you have a, a position so, on that? So, and this is an area where I, I'm not that um, aware of the federal tax and transparency requirements of religions. I do know um, that for a property tax um, exemption, the when they come before us, since an LDS church is allowed the property tax exemption, we see the ward houses, we see the valuation of that area and we approve it. And I'm actually one of nine that goes through that process, serving in a what's called a board of equalization. Um, and in a, and in, then we serve in another um, committee capacity annually to review charitable exemptions. So I do do these exact things. I don't know the federal requirements for that, but I would say if there's a federal tax credit or a federal allowance or a federal, um, you know, a benefit that churches receive, they should absolutely provide disclosure in the same manner that the, at a nonprofit does. So I don't really, I'd have to look into that a little bit more. Uh, but we do have, uh, for property tax exemptions, we do have the transparency through government um, currently. Okay. What, uh, many would want to know what you would do to help address the opioid crisis, you know, as a U.S. Senator. Uh, well, at the federal level, um, we need to, and this, I can talk about campaign finance reform. We've had far too much influence from the manufacturers of opioids and the pharmaceutical companies. We need to rein that in. And Orrin Hatch has been one of the biggest offenders. He supported high, tying the hands of the DEA for prosecution. Uh, and I don't know why. It makes no sense to me. I'd like to hear him defend it because it's horrible. And he's received um, hundreds of thousands from the pharmaceutical industry. So there's that. But um, the there's a number of things. So the opioid crisis first hit my radar only a few years ago. And I think I was ahead of the curve in terms of policymakers. And I started to realize, because I remember when I was first elected, we were facing... Um, a meth crisis, where meth labs were occurring in our neighborhoods, highly toxic. Um, you would, once there was a left meth lab bust, we would need to, I mean, it actually affected the real estate value because the, the, the drugs were so toxic. Um, and now meth is shipped in. But I, I, it took me a couple, it, it, it was only a few years ago I understood the continuum for prescribed opioids for a knee surgery or a back surgery or a wisdom teeth um, pulling. And then before you knew it, people were addicted. And then when their pills were cut back, either because they couldn't afford them or the doctor wouldn't renew the prescription, they turned to heroin. So we now see equal numbers of deaths um, for actual opioid drugs compared to heroin with our death rate in the state of Utah. And um, the opioid crisis is the highest um, cause of death of people under 50 years old right now. It is that horrific. U.S. or Utah? U.S. Okay. And Utah um, fell from third to seven to maybe a little lower recently. but our, Worst or best? We've fallen worst. We were third worst in the nation only a year and a half, two years ago. In opioid, opioid, in opioid deaths. In opioid overdoses. So yes, we're the deaths. top 10 worst yes. in the nation yes. for opioid deaths. I'm told by the state that it's not so much that we're getting better as we go to ninth, 10th, wherever we are. It's that other states are getting worse. 
Uh, so there's so many, I mean, I have been meeting, uh, monthly and doing work in between these monthly meetings of the task force that I founded and co-chair with a Republican on my county council, um, council member, Steve DeBry and I, he's a unified police officer, a captain or a chief actually. Um, I don't want to demote him or he might be mad, but in any event, we meet on a regular basis with the DEA, with our county sheriff, administering our jails, the um, health and human services people at Salt Lake County to figure this out. And sometimes it feels very slow, but um, the federal government can better fund the drug enforcement agency. We need drugs off our streets, something I've been working on um, just over the past week. Uh, We can get more treatment money out to the communities. We know that treatment is never an easy path and it's highly costly, but we have no choice but to fund it unless we want more and more deaths in our community. People willing to get treatment need to be allowed in the door immediately and not wait in line because it's only a moment or two that will lead to their death through, you know, another round of of, um, taking drugs. So, Um, access to treatment and funding is very, very important. And we need to approach it not as a, like anyone, and and I know just by the sheer nature of the numbers that people watching right now have family members who have lost their lives, and it is not their fault. Anybody out here, it is not the fault of the viewers watching this program who have lost a cousin a friend a daughter a neighbor the drug companies created a highly addictive drug that changed the chemistry in one's brain and left people people's respiratory systems um, not functioning at full capacity and people have died and then this movement to heroin because it's cheaper Um, so what i want to say is um, education is so critical Every, everything that we can possibly do and fund needs to be funded and needs to be, we need to make the investment or we're going to continue to see people. We're going to lose a population. Um, we worked at Salt Lake County at um, coordinating with the state and we ended up opening or uh, in attacking it head on by putting police officers on the street and arresting people and either allowing them to go to jail if they had a criminal history, if they were long-term um, you know, drug dealers, they went to jail. If they were users who would get treatment, we moved into treatment. And we actually broke apart the cartels that were dealing in the heart of downtown uh, through Operation Rio Grande. We're now investing in new shelters. They're going to be online in um, a few, like within a year or so. These are highly um, politically charged decisions. And believe me, it's not easy to do this, to move a new dr- a treatment center into a community. But we all have to sacrifice and we all have to uh, be willing to do the hard work around this issue. And we, bottom line, we got to pay for it. And um, it we need to expect insurers to pay more. Again, we need to get, um, influence out of Congress by the drug companies. It's very much part of the problem. What's your view on uh, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana? So I believe we should pass the medical marijuana initiative and that, um, you know, we're going to treat people uh, for a surgery by heavy narcotics in a hospital. We certainly should be able to help people's pain and their treatment um, as you know, if it's a child having seizures or it's somebody approaching death, I think it's just common sense that we would utilize marijuana. Um, and we know that marijuana isn't killing people, at, you know, it's just not. Opioids, um, I don't know how many people, how many lives have been lost in this nation in the, you know, hour and a half we've been talking, but it's far too many. Um, so I think it's just common sense, and Utah's ready for that, and the public's ready for that. We've seen the polling on that. Um, I'm not a fan of recreational marijuana. I'm As a mother, I'm not. I don't want to open that door in the state of Utah. Uh, all right. Talk about, is there, a, is there a pay gap between men and women in Utah, and if so, is that an important issue for you? Yeah, there is, and but we don't know why. And my friend and um, fellow Democrat, Luz Robles, a senator, 
um, Luz Escamilla, uh, I used her maiden name, uh, Luz Escamilla moved this initiative in the session last uh, January and was denied by the legislature uh, the utilization of the study. She had coordinated with one of the universities, I think it was Utah State, to get the research done and to do an assessment as to why we have this gap and the legislature denied it, which is yet again proof that we need more diversity in our legislature, we need different voices, and we need to be willing to ask uh, the tough questions and get answers. So you, uh, I want to see why. And I, I, I've, I'm a working mom. I've worked part-time when my kids are young. I've had a choice. I've worked in – it's – what I really want is any young woman out there – to be able to be her best self and have an avenue to whatever it is. She has a goal to be president of the United States or an astronaut or, you know, wants to stay at home with her children. I want her to have those choices. And I think that takes education and investment and um, us changing as a society and be willing to embrace um, and be more open to what the world of 2019, 2018, 2019 looks like. And I think we're we're uh, opening our eyes, but maybe not as quickly as we need to. And I want to say I appreciate that I've had incredible uh, mentors in my life, women and men. And one of them being Bill Orton, one of them being Robert Redford, one of them being um, you know a guy who supervised me when I was very young and working at Wendy's Hamburgers believe it or not but it's like you I mean there are excellent mentors in the workforce and it women don't have to be mentored by women but men women we we just need to be recognizing that a culture of work is um should be a culture of professionalism and that there I think we hopefully you're getting through women's participation in college because those rates have gone up over the years and we're, we're getting i believe we're turning the corner and we're going to see those stats change and that's my hope um you mentioned something as we were talking before the, the program uh, began to air you know we've seen a lot of economic development in utah utah has turned a few corners in the past decade in terms of you know, big Fortune 500 companies being willing to come in like Adobe, like Goldman Sachs. Um, but you you gave an interesting argument about how having uh, party diversity in the federal positions or even in the state positions could be helpful in attracting, you know, uh, more economic development in yeah. the state. Can you talk about that? Well, I think you've got to you got to take yourself out of Utah to answer this question. What do people perceive Utah to be? And I, um, you know, people are. I mean, I, I still have to dispel the myth of polygamy as I travel. So if people are still thinking we have, um, and and we do have polygamy in the state, and where we have it is a problem. But I think there's a perception for many who don't know much about the Mormon church, that Mormons are polygamists. So we have to dispel that. And if we're having that be a challenge uh, with educated people, then you've got to believe that our reputation is not what it needs to be in terms of attracting new workers to our state. And then you think about, okay, so the Economic Development Division of Utah, um, run by... Uh, very good people of the state of Utah, but tend to be male dominated, uh, one party. Um, you know, let's let's show them the Utah way, and you bring them to Utah, and they don't relate to a workforce that is predominantly male dom- dominated, um, primarily Caucasian. So I think that to show the diversity in Utah in our workforce um, by embracing women by having women in leadership positions, by having, you know, more party diversity. That's all a really good thing for attracting business. So you're saying a, a Fortune 500 CEO might be considering Utah, but it's like, oh, there's so many Mormons and so many white men and so little diversity. And, and so many Republicans. So few women. No. And so- yeah, but really, I mean, like, yeah, exactly. I think it's hard to attract. And, and I don't know that we're different than other communities necessarily, um, in that sense that every commu- community has its own challenges. But I think um, 
a lot, I mean, what does attract people here is the lifestyle. We know access to recreation is one of our big opportunities. So yeah, I think to have uh, a Democrat in the delegation who's promoting Utah's diversity is a very good thing. Yeah. So to so to close, um, uh, what can I guess? You know how can you know, what, what would need to happen for you to have a successful candidacy? There's another way to ask that, which is how do Democrats, what can people do to help the Democratic Party grow in its influence? Is it a cause worth fighting for? Is it a lost cause? What's the path to see Utah become more uh, diverse yeah. in its political affiliations? Well, you know, I'm not going to tell people they should be a Democrat. I'm a Democrat because I align with the Democratic Party for some issues, for some reasons. People can align with any um, political organization, but if but if if they look within their soul and they do identify with Democrats, I think in the state of Utah, I hope they're supporting the Democratic Party's efforts and they get out and vote and they give Democrats a benefit of the doubt. What I think is more important is that we work towards balance in government. So what I would say to a Republican, if, I mean, if you are a diehard Trump supporter and you're, you know, very to the right of the political spectrum, I'm probably not your candidate. I'm just not. Um, that's not what I represent. But I would challenge that person to to look at their interest in wanting balanced representation. And we don't have that in the state of Utah. Five of our 29 senators are Democrats, and they're good people. Um, we have no Democrats in our federal delegation. I can speak to the other side of the aisle. I will do it on Utah's behalf. I bring the lens of a former active LDS person, a mother, somebody who's committed to the community, who's fighting for Utah people. That's what I bring to the table. And I hope that people will see um, the need to have, again, some Democrats in the delegation as a means of balance, fair representation. And I think we can hold each other accountable. And I do want people to also understand that um, I want to work across party lines at the federal level, as I do uh, with my county council. As we engage, we solve problems together. Sometimes we disagree. Sometimes we agree. We more often are working across party lines to solve problems. So that's really what my candidacy is about. But I, again, I think look at the Democrats. Look at all of us. Make a fair assessment of where you land. And, you know, if you're, if you're a long term, if you consider yourself a Tea Party Republican or a white right wing Republican, I, then maybe I don't fit your, you know, I'm outside of your comfort zone. Fair enough. But if you're a moderate, you're an independent, you lean different directions as a or you're a Republican who ha believes in um, issues that may at times land in, on the Democratic side, I think take a hard look at Democratic candidates could because I think that, again, that balance is so critical. If, uh, if there were a young person or even a young woman who wanted to have a political career in Utah, what advice would you give them? Uh, well, you get involved in the community is the first advice. Uh, jump into a campaign if you're high school age even. Um, I think high school is probably the perfect age to engage with a candidate. Uh, find a candidate that represents your values on either side of the aisle. Jump in and uh, go in an intern and see if you enjoy that experience. And I think that this, the world that I live in, there are many, many barriers to entry, including the barriers are quite high for U.S. Senate. But school board members are as young as early 20s, many of them. Um, you know, a, a county council or a county commission seat or a local government seat is not out of reach. And I would say the best and most rewarding thing for me is that my voice is heard in the process. And when I put my head on the pillow at night, I can rest assured that I have had an impact on the system. And that's very rewarding. And I don't get paid big bucks for doing it, um, but I feel that my contribution really does matter. So 
if it, there's a young woman who really is wanting a career that really empowers her voice, um, politics is it. Um, I should have asked you this at the very beginning, but what are like the three to five top priorities that you're running on for this, uh, for your candidacy? Have you yeah. isolated it down uh -huh. to those things? Yeah, and I, I We've will probably say, covered them. just like on my county council, things just come at us and we have to be good decision makers. That's a lot of what we do. But I've um, taken pride on the Salt Lake County Council that I've advanced um, ethics reform and we passed a gift ban that I took, I led on that when I was first elected. I already mentioned that I moved um, health benefits for LGBTQ partners years ago. So there are things you can drive and make a difference on. And at the congressional level, there are three areas that I would focus um, and seek to serve on the appropriate committees. One is reform. We're not going to get past this partisan divide if we don't reform the system. And that means repeal Citizens United, which has allowed far too much money to flow into the system. So I'm, I'm very big into reform. It means how to, can the Senate rules change to make sure that information specialists have a voice. So that's one area is reform. Another area is um, health, health policy, uh, drug addiction, substance abuse, mental illness. Those are areas I've worked on at the local level. I want to reform and assure. I mean, I just think that we have to um, expand health coverage and good quality health in this nation, and we have not done it. The Affordable Care Act um, was a step. It had flaws. We need to fix it, reform it. I don't want to throw it out. I think the idea that Warren Hatch would not allow debate on that issue and just up-down vote, John McCain stepping in and kind of saving the day, in my opinion, on that, it's critical. But now the next era, the next Congress needs to take that on, and I want to be a part of that. Um, I, with Utah's interest in mind, we have two big health providers, two primary, one's the University of Utah Network, the other's Intermountain Healthcare. How do we work within the system so that they can reform under better federal guidance, um, driving costs down and, and, and getting more and more people in the state insured with primary health coverage? That's important to me. And then third area is, I've touched on it, um, economic development on our Wasatch Front it's growth management, transportation funding, figuring out where and how we can have the federal government give our state our fair share on infrastructure and putting it in the right places to kind of manage this explosive growth we're going to have for the short term and, and, and doing what we can to deal with um, the fact that workers are not making enough. They're just not making it with um, many of our jobs in the state. So it's higher wages, better wages, economies. That's what matters in... Um, Weber County, Davis County, Salt Lake County, and Utah County. If you get beyond those counties, we need unique plans. We need to invest. I am frustrated that when I toured the state in the 90s and saw the needs, that not much has changed. Yet many of the people in those communities continue to support this all Republican delegation. I'm like, hey, look at what's going on. You're not getting the new jobs. You tour these other counties, all they want are jobs. They don't want a handout. These counties have unique needs, agriculture to the north and even in the west and central Utah, um, land issues in the south. I'm a big proponent of the payment in lieu increase so that we can have some infrastructure built in these areas, jobs, economies. So it's um, that area is about really the wages and the economic fabric of our state are areas that I want to focus on. Real quick, your thoughts on immigration and uh, separating children from parents? I, I've, I've been horrified by what has happened. Um, let's not point fingers anymore. Let's just get down there and reunite those families. I think it's, um, I'd have to think long and hard to come up another example, example of, Amer of a, a failure in America like the one we've been living the last few months with these families separated. Um, as a mother, I just can't imagine. Um, I think we need to renew DACA and give the protection to families. Let's get people living in this country who have been here a long time working out of the shadows. Let's move them on an immediate path to citizenship. We know that a state like California needs more and more people on the farms, picking the berries, taking care of the needs of our people being contributing members of our community. And I have to say that 
you know, I have such a respect for people from Central America and Mexico who are in this nation, including my husband and I just did a, um, a landscaping project. And my husband walked up to the gentleman when he pulled up his truck, he was a subcontractor, and said, I need to know if you're documented. Um, that's of concern to me and my family, especially my wife's an elected official. And he ensured he, he was, but it was, you know, we, I look at these men who have been working, helping our family. It's a small project. And I look at the work and the ethic and the, the, the friendship we've made with, with people. My husband speaks Spanish, and that's been great. I speak just a tiny bit. But I, I want us to get beyond our prejudice and our stereotyping and embrace people and, and, and have our economy drive some of the renewal of our policies around immigration. We tend to forget that. We, these, I mean, the farm industry utilizes people from South America and Central America and Mexico and, and needs, frankly, the people in this, especially in, a, in such a healthy economy. Um, we should be, we're two or three decades behind on this issue. We're making good, sound policies that protect um, our workers, that protect our nation, that move people in, that are looking for a better life. That's who we are as a country. This problem is one that we can solve. And I, I'm, I'm frustrated and I'm inspired to be in Congress to work on these issues and think that we can do it. I just, I don't want to think that we're going to, in two decades from now, be stuck on this issue. So if uh, there are listeners who really liked uh, what they had to hear today and they want to support you, what are the best ways uh, they can support you? Well, we have a website, um, wilsonforsenate.com. Wilsonforsenate.com. Yeah, I think that's right. I hope that's right. Google me if not. Um, so, yeah, and um, I'd love to hear from you. My email is jenny at wilsonforsenate.com. And no, that's right. Wilson is it right? Okay, thank you. I started thinking because I've had a council website in the past. I'm like, did I get that right? Oh, that's right. Is it elect Jenny? Is it wilsonforsenate.com? Um, check out my website. I have a really tough task in that I need word of mouth to, oh, I mean, Romney's name ID is much higher than mine. He, as I said, he did a great job in the Olympic Games. I think, and I thank him for that, but I think we need a different voice in Washington in this era. So I need friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor. People can host house parties for me. Get your neighbors out. You know, for those of you still going to church, I'd love to come meet at, you know, the ward picnic. Not that I can do it actually at the church, but in your backyard. Um, Romney's actually, I think, frankly, cross the line a little on his, um, he uses faith quite often in his promotion of his campaign. I'm probably a little more subtle, and I think most LDS people are. Um, he's doing a Monday night thing. I'll come on a Monday night and meet with your family. And I just want people to know that my interests are genuine. Um, you may or may not like my politics. If you don't like my politics and you like Ron, please vote for him. But we, I really strongly believe we need a change in the state of Utah. And um, that's what I'm all about. And Friend to Friend is amazing. I didn't have a million dollar transfer for my county council account as he did from his presidential. Uh, so I am needing to raise money, um, a buck here or there. You can do that on my site. Goes a long way. Okay. Um... And uh, yeah, so Jenny for Jenny for Senate dot com. Right? Wilson for Senate. Wilson for Senate. I, th I think I got it right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. So well, we that's wish what happens after like two hours. I'm telling you, yeah. it's getting warm no, no, and my great. mind's not working. I know it's hot. Like, yeah. that, you must do that. You may, it must be some like sort of technique. Yeah. Let's it's an wear them down. It's a CIA, FBI <laughs> yeah. interrogation technique. No, no. But, uh, we, you know, we're really grateful you'd come on a, a a U.S. Senate candidate coming on Mormon Stories. It's a real honor. Thank we you. love the Mormon connection that we're able to talk stuff about the church and Mormonism that it's yeah. that it's actually relevant to our listeners. We're uh, you know we're we're excited to see you doing what you feel is right and to trying to make a difference. And so, on behalf of my listeners, there a lot of listeners uh, are excited. Um, let's see. So Victoria writes. Um, oh. April writes, if you want to support Jenny, share this interview with friends and family. I think that's, that's a great, great idea. We'll have it out in the next uh, few days. Uh, Victoria writes, thank you for this interview. I really enjoyed watching this. I think Jenny's great. I'm British, 
so I can't vote for her, but I would if I could. Uh, she's fabulous. That's great. Um, Angie writes, I'm with so Jenny. So is she actually in Great Britain right now? Oh, yeah. We always so have people awesome. from Australia and England and that's great. Boston and all over the place nice. tuning in. Yeah. We have a global audience for sure. Well, I can't come to Great Britain for a fundraiser. <laughs> I'm traveling the country a little bit for fundraising, but I won't make it there this year, right. unfortunately. But Victoria? Not that I could. Thanks for checking in, I think Victoria. the FEC would probably consider that a violation if Victoria <laughs> hosted something for me, but... All right. Everybody but, else. <laughs> but she appreciates the moral support. Angie writes, I'm with Jenny. Um, let's see. Jill writes, you have my vote. So lots of people are excited about your candidacy. Great. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, we will reach out to the Romney campaign and see if they're willing to come on Mormon stories. So this isn't, you know, trying to show political favoritism or even some sort of editorial position for the Open Stories Foundation or Mormon Stories. We value all our listeners and we understand there are good reasons to be on either side of the aisle. Um, but but when a, a viable, awesome, courageous, strong, uh, confident candidate is willing to come on Mormon Stories for a U.S. A federal office, we're going to take it. So we did. So if any of you have connections to the Romney campaign, let them know we're here in Salt Lake City ready for that interview as well. But uh, thanks to all our listeners for joining us today. Thanks to everyone who supports Mormon Stories podcast uh, financially to make this possible. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. We're transparent in our finances. You can go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button at the top right of the page. $10 a month, $50 a month, $100 a month, whatever you can afford. Uh, we will be dogged in our uh, commitment to supporting uh, Mormons who are departing from orthodoxy and trying to figure out how to transition either to more progressive forms of Mormonism or if they feel they need to leave the church, we're here for you. We have a bunch of workshops and retreats that we do um, every month to support people in transition. You can go to mormonstories.org slash events to learn about those. We're coming to Houston, Idaho Falls, Portland. Uh, We're coming to Sacramento. We've got that Caribbean cruise to the Bahamas. Uh, Lots of events coming up. If you need support in your faith, the religious transition, we're here for you. And we'll do more cool interviews. So if you have ideas for other interviews you want to do, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. And uh, please share this with your friends. You can like us on Facebook. You can give us a positive review at Mormon Stories Podcast on Facebook. Uh, We appreciate that. You can give us a positive review on iTunes. That's helpful. Follow us on Instagram and on Twitter. Mormon Stories is the handle. Thanks for all the support. We love all of you. Uh, Please tune in again soon for more episodes. And Jenny, good luck. Thank you. All right. Four months and counting. Four Uh, and a half, maybe. Four months and counting. Take care, everybody. We'll see you again soon.